Hi everybody, it is November, I can never remember the date anymore, the 23rd, 2017. I hope everybody had a good day. I hope that you were with friends that you can trust and family members that you love and that you really didn't gorge on food, but you thought about the importance of life, you know, you thought about what you really do have in your life to give thanks to and that some of those things didn't include all of the material things that so many people relish, love. You know, I used to say this I wish everybody could have the experience that I had losing everything. Losing everything and then coming across so many people who begin to treat you differently because you don't have that package of success anymore, because you can't work, because you are now in a different class of people because you need help. It really is fascinating when you go through those experiences, if you survive them, to learn who your real friends are, to go through the experience of losing everything and then you're like, okay, well, that external package of success, all of those degrees on the wall, the professional reputation, all of the those looks that you get when people find out that you're an attorney. Now, in my social network, that was regarded as something as a wow. But then when you go into other parts of the country and you talk to an awful lot of different people, it's not such a well. But with the educated elite, it is a well. So you get just from saying that you practice law, that you're an attorney, you get a certain amount of respect. Isn't that bizarre? Now, again, I'm talking about my social network or my former social network. It really is a bizarre thing, especially when attorneys, that group, that profession, so filled with people who are of such a low consciousness, all about ego, arrogant, power hungry, money, money, money. And even within that social network, you know, you find that so many attorneys, you hear people complaining how they, how they treat their clients, they never call back their clients. Um, it's funny that we should be given any kind of respect just because we happen to be in that profession. But it's really fascinating when you're thrown out of it. In my case, it was medications put on the market as safe and I had stroke and I had, uh, I had to end my practice and well, I was outside looking in. And what a trip it is when you're outside looking in. What a different perspective one can get when they're outside looking in. I didn't like it much. I had trouble when I was in it. I did have arrogance, but it, it was not real. I mean, it wasn't, I didn't have much to be arrogant about. I think my arrogance covered up my core belief that I was stupid. So just going to law school, you know, disprove that I was stupid. There's so many stupid attorneys out there. 
Anyway, um, you know, to just go through that kind of experience and and then do all of the work, you know, it pushed me into a far more protracted, intense period of self-reflection and reevaluating all of my values. That was something that I had never done before. I had done the self-reflection. I had done an awful lot of personal work on myself. I had to because I was so filled with so many issues coming from a very uh, severely, malignantly narcissistic, alcoholic, violent home that I did become an adult, just filled with issues. I had to do that work in order to accomplish all that I accomplished. But I never thought about my beliefs. I never thought about those values that I claimed to have until I was tossed out, started to look in, and suddenly my perspective was changing. I was still amongst the same people, but I was different. I was unable to work. I had nothing left. I had no money. I I had a lot of problems cognitively. I felt different because of these problems. I felt like I was in a bubble, literally for 10 years. No joke, it comes back periodically, but literally for 10 years, a solid 10 years, I f it felt like I was um, like saran wrap, you know, was between me and the world. It was very disconcerting. So I've always been very socially at ease. I've never had a problem, never felt uncomfortable, and didn't really understand social anxiety. I could kind of intellectually, but it wasn't anything that I really experienced. I always felt very comfortable talking to strangers or doing anything socially. So suddenly, you know, just this, my new brain that had been stroked out and processing information became difficult. So that stupid at my core, the core stuff, we don't cure it 100%. We can understand it. We can heal it to some degree. There's always that scar. And, and I had, to a pretty big degree, I was beginning to feel less stupid. But amongst my friends, I did always feel like I was less than, that I was um, stupid. They were all the smart ones. and Interesting, isn't it? But it was never, it, it didn't become an obstacle, you know. I knew that it was there, and, and uh, I think in a lot of, um, a lot of times I kind of deferred to those friends of mine. They were the smart ones. So when they spoke, I didn't very often challenge what they had to say. I learned from them and frankly they were very smart. Not wise. Not mature. But book smart. Anyway, um, so that stupid thing, you know, was beginning to inch back up and um, and I felt so insecure. When you do lose that external package of success, 
boy, you better have some substance within inside you that you can hold on to. I had to do an awful lot of work. A real lot. But I began to see right through all of my friends who claimed who claimed to have these principles, these values. But more and more did I see that none of us lived them. We didn't live them. We spoke them. We didn't live them. And the more work I did, yeah, I began to bump up my consciousness and it was like, oh wow, like, okay, you're seeing the world differently. You're hearing things differently. Um, so it was a real remarkable time, intense, learned so much that I had never even considered or focused on throughout my entire life. It was just uh, or adult life. It was just a matter of accomplishing those goals and then proceeding on in your career. I don't have any glasses that actually stay on my head. Um, so, and as I, uh, throughout the years of that very intense, very long, period of self-reflection, I began to understand myself in a way, or know myself in a way, that I had never. I began to see how, I don't think I was ever someone who just didn't care, and I, I think that I was you know, at a level of compassion that I could experience it automatically. In terms of children and dogs and, and four-leggeds and animals, any kind of abuse or any kind of shaming of children or anything like that. I welled up and it compelled me to speak out, to speak up. But in terms of people, you know, I was like everybody else. You watch the news, you hear about some tragedy that has fallen upon someone or you hear about uh, the US military bombing countries, the Iraq war, I'd be horrified or I'd hear some tragedy on the news and I'd say, my God, what a shame. And then the next news segment, that was gone and you're on to the next news segment and you really don't do much. Yeah, I was against the Iraq war. Well, that was when I had the stroke and my life was falling apart. Um, but would I have gone out and protested? I don't know. I was too busy. I didn't have to be too busy. But that's, you know, everything was about my little world, my little life, my, 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 me, me, me. And when my life drastically changed, I did begin to see how certainly those around me, everything was about them, them, them. So we talked a good game, but we didn't really do anything. Was I ever, you know, this patriotic American who was rah, 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 war? Never. I was always against all wars. Was I somebody who was a justice freak, as I have been so named by a lot of people? Yeah, that was absolutely true. It was genuine. Where did I get that from? 
I believe that I got it from being the scapegoat in a severely malignantly narcissistic family. I say family. It was, you know, it, it stems from the severity of the narcissism, malignant narcissism within my mother. But it was so severe that it infected everybody. So, um, I saw the injustice. I knew that I was getting blamed. Somewhere I knew. As a child, we don't really know how to formulate the kind of uh, thinking that allows us to get, all right, my mother is not well, and uh, I am being blamed every single day for something that I have not done. But, you know, you don't, you don't think like that. But somewhere you get there's an injustice here. That's why I think a lot of kids act out and get angry. So, and when injustice took place in front of me, I had a hard time with it. I had a very hard time with people being treated badly. I had an experience that it is the reason why I chose to be an employment discrimination attorney, plaintiff only. No, I was not a corporate attorney. You know, fighting for the underdog. That has been who I've been pretty much my entire life. Is it because I'm just a wonderful selfless human being? No. Experience. Experience made me that. Made me fight for the underdog. I was the underdog. I don't like how it feels to be so unjustly treated. And so that was so at my core that when I would see other people being unjustly treated, yeah, a compassion did well up in me for them. So I take back what I just said about the compassion welling up only for children and, uh, and the four-leggeds or any, actually any kind of life form that is not human. But, um, but I was still at that low level of consciousness, so ego-driven and so driven, not consciously. It's only when I did all of that work, that self-examination, the self-reflection, did I understand, wow. So needing the approval of a mother that hates you, so needing the approval of a sister that hates you, so needing to be respected because I had never been. So needing people to think I was not stupid. Many of the choices that I made in my early adult years stem from all of those unresolved issues. You know, I wonder if I had resolved all of those issues would I have chosen law school? If I had resolved all of those issues, I probably would have gone on in psychology. I was going to go on and get a doctorate in clinical psychology. And actually, it was a very good decision that I don't go there. Because therapists, psychotherapists, social workers, um, anybody in that field, psychologists, can do an awful lot of harm to those that come to them for help when they have so many issues left unresolved because they come out in those sessions and they can cause a lot of damage. And I don't doubt that had I gone on and just become a clinical psychologist instead of an attorney that I was not ready at all to do that.
I still didn't fully understand how the past controls us. I still didn't fully understand all of my issues. So how could I possibly understand anybody else's? All right, so that was that was a very good decision uh, on my part. But um, but I didn't understand that my ego was driving me. I didn't understand that I was pretty much just a programmed robot eager to get that external package of success. But it didn't have anything to do with who I was. It had everything to do with who you were and how you would look at me. And how sad is that? Well, I know that an awful lot of people are driven. As I was. And I know that an awful lot of people choose careers, make choices based on wanting the approval of mommy and daddy. That they wouldn't ordinarily choose if they had a stronger sense of self. So this work I have always known, certainly for the last two decades, but more and more and more every day do I get how intricately connected it is to the nightmare that we live. Um, and you can have an awful lot of knowledge, you can have a tremendous amount of degrees on the wall, and still be somebody of a low level of consciousness where everything really is about you, even though you're telling yourself it's not, even though other people may be telling you, wow, you went to become an attorney to help people who got, who got fired or um, demoted, who had to suffer the consequences the consequences to their livelihood for reasons that they cannot change. Disability, color of skin, sexuality, whatever. And how wonderful was I that I chose deliberately to fight for the individual who got harmed rather than rather than choose what would have been a really comfortable side working for a corporation. Um, and that was a choice based on an experience that I had, not me having to suffer the consequences, but knowing somebody else who did, and I'll post a video on that experience, but I didn't have any choice. I, it wasn't. It wasn't a matter of choice for me to work for a corporation, because something inside me just never even that was not on the radar for me. But boy, did I get a lot of kudos just being in that profession and. Kudos from people who believed, you know, that I was, you know, doing the good work and everybody should be doing the good work. It's not a matter of kudos. It's just, why aren't, why isn't everybody? But, when I did learn I lose that external package of success. That's when you got to dig deep. You don't survive unless you find that there's something inside you that is good enough for you to stick around. For me, that became the truth. the truth. 
justice, obviously. So I also began to understand what is really important in life. Family, friends, real friends, genuine friends, trust, not lying to one another. But I also, having done so much work, I did become stronger inside. Not physically. My circumstances just kept getting worse and worse and worse. But there was a solidness that I was beginning to feel. I began to know who I was and I could actually state it to people. And I remember, you know, moving to Great Barrington and meeting a lot of people and um, and in AA, you know, you do end up where, at least this was my experience, you know, suddenly you move to a new area, you're kind of like the, the you know, new blood, and you end up talking to a lot of people, and I never had problems meeting people. Um, I always had a lot of people in my life, uh, and never had problems making friends, all that kind of stuff. So, but I became somebody different than who I had ever been before. I felt very secure within myself to say to a lot of the friends that I had then, I don't go to the movies on Saturday nights just to do something. I don't just go out for coffee to shoot the shit. You call me, you gotta have a reason. Don't just call to yak when I saw you last night. Um, I'm serious. My interests are different than a lot of people. I, you know, love documentaries. I don't really like to go out to dinner, but I love to make dinner for people and have friends over and talk. I began to understand who I was, and I had no problem putting it out there. Funny, the most important thing that I had said to a number of people who would then get, you know, I'd get a little bit closer to the person and and I was never anybody who was interested in superficial, you know, let's talk about clothing and shopping. And I talk to people. So, inevitably, however it came about, I would say to people, just don't lie to me. Don't lie, because it's kind of the kiss of death with me. Because then I'm just going to question everything. And it doesn't have to be a big lie. And wow, did I learn that so many people lie. And then do not stand accountable for their lies. It was rather fascinating finding out that even the very close friends that I've had, they know in my life got destroyed by lies the lies of, you know, those who were giving me those prescriptions claiming that these medications were safe, that destroyed my career, and the lies of the FDA, the lies of my family, though, the hardest to deal with. And these lies are big, you know, destroyed my reputation, uh, and literally it went on and on and on, throwing me into a personal nightmare that was such a head-spinning 10, 12 years. No joke. Even those who knew how important it was to not lie to me, they still lied. 
and then they would lie about their lie. And because I really cared about them and didn't want to lose them as friends, I would confront them and please ask them to stop and don't you understand the importance and it didn't matter. Then, then, because they were incapable of standing accountable, they then would attack me. But I began to understand that it has nothing to do with me. I get to feel it, I get to experience it, but I started to understand that there's a difference between taking something personally and feeling it personally. I don't take personally somebody else's lying. I don't take personally somebody else's inability to stand accountable for whatever wrong they do. I feel it personally, but it's not about me. They've made choices to continue on doing the exact same thing that they've always done. Whether it's a conscious decision or they're just incapable of um, doing the work necessary to resolve whatever it is within them that makes them lie. But um, I began to really fully understand where I end and another person begins, which helped a lot in terms of my scapegoat mentality. I think that I am the blame of everything. I don't even have to be, I don't even have to be present for something to go on, for me to feel guilty like I am the cause of everything that goes on. And while I may still feel that, I know intellectually I'm not because I've been able to understand. And the awareness now that I have of myself, how I am, you know, in relation to other beings, the awareness, situational awareness of what's going on around me, personal awareness of how I am. Uh, responding and it's it's there now it's no longer an exercise for me it's just there but all of this has allowed me to develop a kind of new courage you know the courage I had before and I have to say that wherever I got it I don't know but I literally did a 180 on my life. So from, from where I came from and where I was going and all of the challenges that I continued to bring into my life, it was, as my mother said, unfucking believable She's saying that decades ago. So, um, but this courage was more a kind of personal courage. This courage was my putting myself out there, my knowing who I am, and my knowing that I was not your typical um, person in terms of my social network. I was different. I was the one who stopped getting afraid because in terms of my speaking out when I would hear the racist jokes or something like that, yeah, I was really afraid, but I couldn't not. Sometimes I'd remain silent and that feeling was worse than the, I'm going to get abandoned, you know, I'm going to be not liked, I'm going to lose friends. It became more, for me, a this is who I am, this is what I'm about, 
and confronting people, that became something that I no longer had a choice. I saw it had to be done because I began to get the connection between our individual wrongs, the individual and the collective. I began to understand that we're all, we all contributed to this nightmare. And in order to make the world a better place, it's a must. It's a must. We can't remain silent. And I also began to understand what true friendship really is. It's not just about hanging about with another human being, you know, to um, fill up the time that otherwise we'd be bored. And then just going out and having a good time. Yeah, part of that is that. But what's more essential for me was to be with friends who were also people genuinely on that spiritual road. Now, virtually everyone of my friend claimed to be. Now, remember, I was an AA. AA, that's, you know, the place where you actually work on yourself and you grow and you try to understand those issues and you try to understand yourself. Well, that's how it was when I first got into AA in 1980. Uh, things have changed. But I found myself continually knocking heads with people and not fully understanding it. They claiming to be people who were spiritual and growing and doing all of this work, but then when you would get kind of into those kinds of conversations or something would happen, you know, then you would get the blowback, you know, it'd be like, whoa, wait. But I couldn't stop because I knew the importance of all of this individual work. Now, I would stop with, you know, individuals when I get the blowback, which was always like, all right. Um, But no, you know, I do believe that friendship is about having companionship and having, you know, um, things to do, you know, with another human being. But it's also, it's also about absolute honesty. If you don't have that, you have nothing. But it's also about um, helping each other to grow, helping each other along that spiritual road. But I found myself continually facing people who were stagnant and they wanted to remain that way. They wouldn't grow. They couldn't get beyond the low consciousness where everything was about their own pleasure and everything had to be about pleasure and everything was seeking their own happiness and And God forbid, you know, you try to engage them in something serious. Then it was that seventh grade behavior of calling you names or rolling the eyes. The gossip I hated. I hated it. 
I would hear friends rip other friends that weren't there to shreds. Yeah, I always said something. And I never got a really good response. I always got shamed. Oh, Carol, you're so mature. Or what? You know. Or when I would hear people retell experiences. Experiences that I was present in. And they would be talking about somebody else involved in that experience who was no longer there, but they would retell it in a way that was not true. Exaggerating or sticking in a few things that just didn't happen. And yeah, I would say something. And then I was attacked for embarrassing someone for and I did try to do it in the most diplomatic way so doing what I believed was right it became a force in me that is almost I, I can't even say that it, it's of me it's more of I think this is just what happens when you do raise your consciousness where there's something that compels you. Compels you to to speak up and do what's right. So that's why I have said to people that I, I wish that everybody could have my experience because they would have a completely different perspective. But I have to say that it's been painful. So I go back and forth to wish everybody could have that experience so that they could grow and they could begin to understand who they are and stand firm on who they are bump up their consciousness so they would get the difference between saying that they care and having compassion to true compassion and care is a verb just like love is it compels it's a force within yourself that I don't necessarily attribute to myself. I didn't consciously set about, you know, to to be who I am. I don't feel like a courageous, good human being. I do feel like something else is operating a lot of the time. But I do believe that everybody has to get to that point where something beyond themselves takes over and compels action, where the care is generative. I've said this so many times. Mark Passio talks about how care, we need to do the work necessary to get to the point where the care is a generative force generating you to take action. And without that, we don't take action. We just claim to care about things. So, um, I'm sorry for going on so long. I will tell you I'm not doing very well physically, cognitively, um, And I will continue to do my best until the fat lady sings. But I am having difficulty. Uh, I do think that a lot of it has to do with the frequencies. So um, I ask for your patience. And uh, I hope that you stick with me. And this channel... 
I hope I can continue to devote it to the personal work that is necessary in this uh, fight against, you know, the evil. And yeah, there is a courage that's different in me. I think what happens is through the process of reevaluation of all those values and beliefs that you have, um, the self reflection, critical examination of, of how you are living your life, your own behaviors, it is absolutely necessary in order to change who you are and to bump up your consciousness. So, um, when it's bumped up, life takes on a different kind of seriousness. And it's not about you. You're kind of second. You know, you're in the back seat to everything else that's going on. And And I've been very frustrated because I know that that is the piece that not a lot of people talk about. And without that kind of work in which we never stop because it never stops, it continues until the fat lady sings and we're out of here. It never stops. The, the process of maturation, it didn't stop when we became the legal age of 18 or 21. That's when it begins. But we, as Americans, on the whole, don't do the work, the personal work. A lot of people think that they do. You get an awful lot of people who go to AA and they go to the meetings and they get sober and they might do a fourth step, but they don't really dig deep into themselves. The critical analysis or the critical examination of their own behaviors doesn't take place an awful lot with people. So they continue on as a sober human being, doing things to bring themselves a good time. I guess because the serious work of digging deep and the painful work of going, Jesus, I was really an asshole then, or my God, my response was really immature, all that kind of stuff. It is painful. And maybe recovering alcoholics don't like to go there because they're afraid they'll drink or something, but that means that they still have an awful lot of insecurity within themselves. Um, so, yeah, Americans are, on the whole, a very immature people as adults. So, how could we possibly? manifest any kind of change. Americans on the whole lie all the time because the pretense, yeah, the external package of success, I'm, ex I'm, I'm good, huh? I got the house, I got the car, I got the clothing, I got the, the degrees on the wall, I've got it, I got it, hey, look at me. But it's all about they getting the approval or they being one up than their neighbor or their sister, brother, siblings, cousin, whatever. You know, the competition and comparing one another. You know, it, it's a mess. But it all keeps everybody at a low level of consciousness and, and, uh, And at that low level, we're getting nowhere, nowhere. And I am somebody who gets really tired of the same old, same old, you know, 
years of posting on current events. I can hardly go to my websites anymore. Because it's the same old, same old. Yeah, different names, and but it's the same play over and over and over again. Details, you know, change here and there. I like, I need to be around that kind of energy where something is changing and people are changing and people are, you know, engaged in this fight that we've got going on collectively, but they're also engaged in the individual work to change themselves. And look, I know how difficult it is. I know what it's like to live suffering the consequences of the destruction that is happening. I know what it's like to live uh, suffering the consequences of evil. And I've done it. Not only the evil coming out of our government and the FDA and my career getting destroyed, but I do it every single day having to live the consequences of the evil that unfortunately is within my own family. They have destroyed my life. They have made sure that I don't succeed again. That was the point. They made sure that I don't recover. They made sure that I go homeless. They played all of the games that the malignantly narcissist plays. I've had to withstand the judgment of everybody believing that um, believing that I'm living what they're living and I'm so not. Um, I've withstood the judgment coming out of people who hate what I have to say. I've withstood the friends who I had to walk away from and the betrayals and the lies and being lied about. I've withstood the attacks the personal attacks. I've hung on having literally nothing but a computer to keep going to stay in this fight. I literally have less now than I did when I was in Great Barrington and even then I had lost a lot. I keep going, chronic physical pain, really now remarkably sensitive to the frequencies because now when I go into any store or my doctor's office or my friends today who has Wi-Fi, I show up, I do the best that I can. It's limited now. I had to leave early. But I show up. I keep showing up. And I know that everybody can do the same. If they get their care to that generative force. Because that is what that's the the gas in the engine. That's what fuels you. You just keep going. And I have no idea how long I'm going to keep going. Day at a time, doing my best. But you know, why is any of this important to me? I have no children. I have no family. I don't know what life is about. Why was the Constitution so important to me? Two things that were really, really important to me. Constitution and the 12 steps of AA. 
I think they're brilliant, both. I just don't like how man interprets. the words. I don't like the I, I don't like the um, for the Constitution it was something that was remarkable. It gave Americans something that no other people in the world had. It was a precious gift. The we the people, if we could have actually upheld our part of the bargain to keep our government limited, to keep the states, these kind of individual nations in the United States you, the small you of United, United States, meaning that each state was its own nation. Federal government limited. If we could have fought like hell to really make that Constitution really mean something, have it be that 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 it just was the bedrock. We could have been something incredible not individually, but just why do you think country why do you think so many people say to Americans, you lose your freedom, we all go down? I grew up. I was my entire family's from Scotland. I was the first born American. I had no clue what it meant. My family didn't talk about this country, didn't talk about Scotland, didn't talk about anything. So, um, and I started cutting school in first grade. I did not have your normal upbringing and the normal indoctrination, which was actually a real gift, but I didn't learn anything. So when I started, when I became an adult and got sober and got through a couple of my, you know, issues, I, I began to do research and I went back to school. I began to look at that constitution as something like, it's a real wow if we could actually have man honor it. But most people are at a low level of consciousness, so it's all about them. It's all about ego. That's where you have all of these attorneys who are just so ridden with the disease of arrogance and wanting power. Judges think that they're better than. We have politicians who are supposed to be our servant but we end up bowing to them. We've got it all wrong. But yeah, it is very upsetting to me. I didn't have a family. I don't have roots. I don't have any, any um, understanding as to uh, my place in the world. I, I, I know nothing of my family. I'm just, I was brought into the world and, well, left alone. So, those things that are really important to me are not so important to other people. Trust in your society is incredibly important to me. So when you hear me 
talk about people lying and everything. You also have to understand who I am. I grew up hearing lies. Really horrible lies. Lies that were more important to tell than your own safety coming out of your mother, putting you in really threatening situations. Yeah. You either, I guess, become a liar yourself or you become rather adamant about the truth. And And when you're brought into the world and you're not wanted, really not wanted, your life, you're always given that message that you shouldn't exist. They literally do want you dead. No joke. If you don't have any connection to anything, you don't know anything about, you know, your lineage or any family, not even your own mother or father you know very little about. Well, what are you connected to? You don't hear anything about Scotland. You're not hearing anything about America because the reason they came here was gold on the streets. Money, money, money. What are you connected to? So I got really connected to AA, the 12 steps, and I took them seriously. The Constitution, and what could be, what could be, if we all participated in growing, maturing, and and living honestly and speaking honestly, what could be here? It could have been incredible. And it is very upsetting to me to see this go. It is very upsetting to me that we had opportunities when we were younger and now to see all of the adults, just so many, don't care that those who are younger, they don't have the opportunities we had. The freest nation in the world has become a tyranny. It's become a tyranny, a police state, committing atrocities all over the world. We had so much here. We had more than any other people in the world. And it could have been incredible. It really could have been. So, um, I, I know we're not going to get anywhere unless the individual changes. That's, that's the heart of changing a society, the individual. But the individual has to do the work in order to change. You know, what is it about Americans who have property, who know what's coming? And they sit back and do nothing. They don't get involved in their own communities. They don't do anything to find out 
what their own town councils are up to. What, what happens to an individual that knows that there is an agenda in place to deprive them of their own private property and they don't do anything within their community to find out how the agenda is being implemented. What's wrong with that individual? There is a disconnect happening. So for so long we've had this psyche here somebody else will fix it. This is a community thing. You gotta get involved in your own in your own communities. It takes work, it takes effort. And I will admit, I don't feel connected to any place, you know. I did lose my, my, the ground underneath me. I tried to get something here started and I tried in Great Barrington. But I kept trying in Great Barrington because I was more rooted there, familiar within my own people. Yeah, they're the liberal progressive, but there were so many and there were so many opportunities to meet new people and, and they had lectures and a lot going on that I could attend, look around the room, try to scope out who might be, really listen carefully to, you know, we would have people come to the town and give talks on various subjects and afterwards I would speak to you know, the person giving the lecture, I would, you know, question just to see how awake they were. There, that never stopped. So when I left Great Barrington, you know, I'm like, okay, where, yeah, I lost my connection to everything. So this is all that I've been able to do. And it has been profoundly frustrating and stressful for me. I don't have property, I don't have any, I have no connection to anything anymore. Why do I want to see other people fighting to keep what they have? First of all, I wouldn't wish on an enemy what I have lived. While I would like people to experience what I've lived just so that they could begin to do the work personally on themselves, it has been extraordinarily painful, stressful, scary to have no one at your back. Very scary. But I would like to see people fighting to keep what they have. I would like to see people respect themselves enough to do that, to take the action. Because it really does reflect. They, having that kind of maturity, but also a respect for their own self, that they would do whatever it takes to protect what they have. And I love being around that kind of energy. The energy being around people who are who are still just on that low level, who engage in the lying and filling up, you know, their every moment with activities so that they don't have to confront, you know, their own self. 
They don't have to really see the big picture of what's taking place. It's an energy that drains me. It zaps my, my energy. And I've been around it over and over and over again. The thing is, and I don't want you to think that this is egotistical or anything, it's not. I have had an experience that has taught me a lot, that has helped me grow. I have done the work necessary to change, to mature to whatever level I am at. And I'm not saying that this bump up in my consciousness that that's it. No. When you finally do get to another level, you go, wow, okay, there are different levels here which you don't recognize when you haven't done any of that work. And when you recognize that there are other levels, well, then you get to see you're still at a really pretty low level. All right, that's okay. I'll keep working. So no, this is not about me thinking as great or, you know, I still think I'm at a pretty low level. There's more work to be done. But when you do get pumped up, you got to find people who are, you know, at that level, kind of on the same page because you find that the people at that low level of consciousness drag you down. They drag you down. They drag you down. You want so much to give them the gift of a higher consciousness, they don't recognize it as a gift. It is a gift. You want so much for them to really fully understand who they are. And that is a gift. To engage somebody in that, on that level and, you know, have a friend that will actually engage and really trying to do that work, you know, to discover who they are, to heal those or resolve those issues from their past. And suddenly you see that genuine, authentic being coming to life. It's fabulous. It's wonderful. But almost nobody likes it or wants it. They get angry. And it drags you down. Because there are far more people at a low level of consciousness where they can all support one another walking the low road. That sounds like I'm walking the high road. Nah, I'm just kind of up the up on the curb, maybe. But it's a continual energy drag. So I do find that um, I'm now needing to do something different and really beginning to, I need to start talking about what I believe is absolutely fundamental to the kind of change that we all talk about but have not been able to really manifest. Essential in this is trust. Essential. Essential is trust. Cyber world, social media, in real life, you have to speak the truth. Because without trust, there is nothing. And I will tell you, social media has destroyed my trust. I've had subscribers lie to me. 
I've had subscribers lie about me. I've had subscribers play me. I have been broken to the point where my trust now, it's not that kind of crazy, um, don't even want to say crazy because however broken I am, people can really be broken to a point where they begin to manifest, you know, these, the, the, the kind of behaviors or life where they're just not even going to engage with people. No, I'll continue to engage. But now, Um, I won't do things that I used to do. I'm very reluctant to um, I'm very reluctant to engage the way I used to engage. That's all I want to say. Why? There's a ripple effect. And you're either going to put out a good ripple effect or a bad one. Lying is a really bad ripple effect. Lying destroys trust. You don't lie to someone that you know has had their life destroyed by lies. And while I understand that lying is an issue for people, it's not the lie that is so upsetting to me. It's the refusal to stand accountable and try to work through the need to lie and begin to manifest a being who's trustworthy. And if you really want to see me get angry, keep lying and then start attacking me as if I've done something wrong. That's when I lose it. The trust has to come back. It is fundamental. I've had people lie in their comments and I'm going to be doing some videos on comments which I hope to be able to get one up today. That is the basis of a healthy society. Trust. It's gone. Six years ago, I did not have the lack of trust that I have now. It affects everything. It affects my relationship with all new subscribers. So I thank all of those who lied to me because your ripple effect brings people to a point where suddenly other people have to live the consequences of your lies. And I know now that it is really taking me a very, very long time to feel um, somewhat uh, secure in new relationships. Not that I'm a terribly insecure person, that's not what I mean, but I'm. there's always that Okay. All right. I had another conversation that was great. But it's kind of like waiting for the shoe to fall. Waiting to hear it. When that when lying becomes just like you're inundated with it. You meet up with people and boom, they lie. And then lie again and when you're like surrounded by that, it does have a really profoundly bad effect on the individual that you're lying to, 
but it also, the ripple extends far and it touches other people. I was far more open and welcoming of an awful lot of people when I first got on YouTube. Six years later, I can have a great conversation for hours and hours with somebody and then I get off the phone and I go, well, where is this going to go? Don't know. I wish, I wish that I could live in a world where I could just trust people. And that to me is the most important thing, so I can't lie. I just can't. I won't. I, I, it's not, be the change you want to see. Be the change you want to see. If you want to see trust begin to form in our society, that means you've got to speak honestly and live honestly. So, um, sorry for going on. I know that this is long. And I, I've been having a lot of problems with my brain. Memory, pulling things together, organizing my thoughts, and uh, what a trip this world is. Okay, let me just say this one last thing. Our soul is really important. Our own individual soul. Not too many people think about that. I didn't when I was at that low level of consciousness. Yeah, I read some books and I thought about it sometimes, but you know, I didn't I didn't get the connection between everything I do and every word I speak either hurts or heals or makes stronger the good soul or the bad soul. You know, it's kind of like, oh, what is that saying? You know, I can't remember verbatim, but the two wolves, right? We've got two wolves inside of us all. And one is mean and one is good. So which wolf are you feeding? You know, the mean one or the good one? And... God, I really uh, screwed that up, but um, I don't know what comes after our life. Maybe nothing, but I'm not, I'm not going to be living as if that's the case. Maybe I will see God and God is going to be then judging me. I want God to know that I have done everything I possibly could. Everything I possibly can do, could do, to become who God created, if in fact God created me. I don't want to betray God. So I've got to get rid of all of that indoctrination and inculcation and all of those unresolved issues that that really it just make us into these programmed robots of other people, we got to get to our authentic self. And if you believe that God created you, 
That is, that is the job you have to do to get to that authentic person God created. If we're energy and our bodies are just this shell that, you know, we have amassed around this energy. I mean, my God, we're 70% water. Jesus. Energy, our body dies, but we live on. Our soul lives on. And perhaps we come back. Maybe we do have lessons to learn in this lifetime. And it's not about getting degrees. And it's so not about having big houses, big cars. No, our lessons are personal to each and every one of us. We've all had a very unique experience. And yeah, I've had an awful lot of lessons to learn and I'm still learning them. But if that's the case, and I do come back, I want to make sure that I come back a better human being than I've been in this life. So, yeah, I do take a lot of things very seriously. And, you know, I used to laugh a lot. So many people, you know, don't know what I was like, so many people. There's no one in my life who knows me. There's no one in my life that knows what I've done. I don't have any connection. I don't talk to anybody. You know, I did visit a friend who had family over today. I listened to them talk about, you know, and really interesting. The woman who I gave um, this German Shepherd to, we've become friends. And her brother is not a subscriber. He doesn't subscribe to anybody, but he bookmarked my channel. I've talked to him on the phone. He was watching my channel. So um, I met him today for the first time. But I listen to she and her brother talk about their childhood. That's absent from my life. Everyone that I've met, they don't know me. They don't know who I used to be. They don't know that I used to actually laugh a lot. Even when I was going through everything in Great Barrington, still losing everything, trying to get my life back. Yeah, I failed, but I was laughing, laughing. You know what? Joy can be pummeled out of people. So, and people can literally be so reduced, first of all, when they're being pummeled by their own family, told how worthless they are and and the message ultimately is, will you die already? It doesn't make you feel very good. When they've so destroyed your reputation and everything that you have worked for, everything that you've become never gets acknowledged by anybody in your life. Never. It's, it is a very difficult road to walk. It's not an easy life. And I say this because I have received a lot of comments from people. Oh, they want me to relax and they want, you know, go out and have some joy. And I'm not living the life you are living. I used to. I don't anymore. Um, joy. It's a byproduct of, of having a nice life. It's a byproduct of having uh, family 
that you love and they support you and it's a byproduct of having friends who you can trust. So when you lose everything, you really do get kind of, and you have no money and you have, your life has just become something that it never was. And all the things that you had, the resources that you had five years ago when you were still in your life, you no longer have. So saying that to somebody is probably not the best thing. Because if I could have it, I'd have it. And if I could go out and relax, I'd be doing it. And if I could work, I'd be doing it. And if I could, if I could, if I could. But you don't know who I was and everything that I've accomplished and how I never stop. You don't know what my life is and what it used to be. So when I hear people say things, I get the presumptions that they make which are automatic and we've got to do the work necessary to rid ourselves of these filters that are in our head that allow us to hear things that are not said or fill in the gaps with these facts that we conjure up not even conscious of the fact that we are doing it so we write down these st this stuff and it's not true but we write it in a definitive way that it sounds like true and I meet that over and over again with people. Um, presumption is it, it's, it's an automatic thing. So you get a couple of facts about somebody and then you presume a story about their life. And we've got to do the work necessary to become conscious of how we think so that we can better speak the truth. Because when we speak presumption, very often we're just speaking lies. Lies about people. Lies are not just... Um, these outright things that we might feel a ping when we say it, you know. Lies come in all different forms. The pretense that we live is a lie. Exaggerating um, our own abilities or exaggerating somebody else's response or uh, sticking in just one little thing that may spin the entire retelling of an experience. All of it is lies lies, lies, you know, um, claiming that you are going to work on your issues when you don't do anything, uh, a lie, claiming that you love me when you don't is a lie. I don't need to hear that, you know, I need people to be honest always. Um, but I say that love me because, you know, it's the, the word is just so tossed around that it's become meaningless. I need people in my life who live deliberately, consciously. It is what I try to do. So, a long, long talk. What do you do on Thanksgiving when you don't have family? You get on YouTube and you talk to your subscribers. Yeah, my life became pretty pathetic. And I will tell you, that I don't know an awful lot of people who could have survived it.
I'll make that bold statement. It has become pathetic. It has become empty of virtually everything that I've had. That's okay. That's the truth. It didn't become this way because I sat around doing nothing and watched all of the plates fall or my life collapse. I busted ass trying everything that I possibly could do. And when you have a stroke, you really do need help. You're, you're thinking, trying to manage things gets very difficult. And if you don't have anybody in your life, that will step in and manage those things as you're trying to recover. Man, family is important. Very important. Friend, friendship. Do you know when I left Great Barrington? When was it, 2012? My so-called friends that loved me, not one, contacted me. One did, actually, telling me that she would get my dogs and that I should just come back and get into a hospital, psychiatric hospital, right. You have a family that literally worked to get you homeless. It took them 10 years, 10 years, my hanging on. Only those who have had these severely malignantly narcissistic families, when you are the scapegoat, can fully understand. But not one friend, even my closest friend, my closest friend never contacted me. Now that's love, ain't it? People gotta get real. Ciao guys.